It's sometimes useful to keep private data away from the body of classes or structs themselves. Let's see why and how to do it effectively using the bridge pattern in both C++ and Rust. The essence of the bridge pattern is quite simple to grasp. Our object should expose methods which then forward calls to another object containing the actual implementation. First, let's see how to make this happen and then try to answer why. Our first implementation will involve C++, so if you're interested in Rust version, you can skip ahead. We'll do it in steps, from the simplest case to the more abstract one. The simplest one involves having one concrete class which contains a pointer to a concrete implementation class. First let's create a class which will represent our actual implementation, which should be private and hidden from the outside world. Let's call it widget impl, because why not? And inside let's create one method for now. Void foo without anybody. Let's pretend something's in there. As for the public class which will expose the interface itself, let's create a widget. Here also let's create a foo method. But what should be inside? First, we need to store a pointer to our actual implementation. This will be kept private, of course. We'll use a unique pointer. Okay, having our private implementation ready, we simply forward the call inside foo. And that's it. That's the whole bridge pattern in its simplest case. This variant of the bridge is also known as pimple. And as we can see, all it does is simply forward all calls to the implementation class itself. This gives us the possibility for having multiple implementations, all of which are hidden behind our single public widget. We can also go a bit more abstract. We can have a widget being an interface and have concrete implementations of widget, which create concrete implementations of widget impulse. Sounds a bit complicated? Well, let's see in practice. First, let's turn our widget imp into an interface. So simply making few things virtual and then let's add two concrete implementations. Here we are, we have our basic widget implementation and our advanced widget implementation. Now let's move on to the widget itself. Again let's turn it into an interface and create two concrete subclasses. Well actually widget won't be an interface in the classical sense because we will keep the foo method here which will still call our imp foo. But we will do something else. We will hide the constructor as protected. We will remove first the default one and create one which takes a pointer to our implementation. Let's remove this thing and, and simply move impl inside. I think you might already know where this is going. For the purposes of clarity, let's pretend all the move constructors, copy constructors and operators are handled. I don't want to clutter the code here. So now let's create our two concrete widget implementations I talked about. Here we go. Just like in the widget implementation case, we have our basic widget and advanced widget, and all they do is create concrete widget implementations, ah, and I already see a typo here, ah, that's better, and those implementations are then forwarded upwards to the widget. Widget itself doesn't know what kind of implementation it's dealing with, it simply forwards its calls. We can even create a factory for concrete widget types creating concrete implementations, or we cannot use widget subclasses at all and use the strategy pattern to inject implementations. Now let's try that in Rust. Let's start with having a concrete struct with a single implementation. So let's our create our struct widget impl. For the implementation part, let's add 
a function foo which will do something. Let's pretend it does something. In our case it will be simply empty for the purposes of this video. Foo. Here we go. This is our implementation which we want to hide from the outside world. As for the public part, let's create a concrete struct called a widget. Start. Widget implementation will be a box of widget impl. As you can see, the actual implementation is hidden behind a pointer. Now let's go to the implementation of the widget itself. We naturally would like to introduce a constructor function. So our function here does nothing more than simply create a widget with some default widget implementation. Now let's add our foo function which will do only a single thing. Forward the call to the actual implementation. So as you can see, the implementation details which are here are hidden from the outside world since the outside world only sees this. To make this clearer, let's add pub and pretend it's in a module of some sorts. If you want to have various widget implementations, we can add a level of abstraction. So let's add different private implementations and leave widget impl as a simple interface. So let's change it to trait. And inside, let's declare our full function. Now let's create our first concrete widget implementation. It will be our basic widget impl. And let's implement widget impl for our basic imp widget impl. So we simply change this. We can also add another concrete implementation and we have an advanced widget implementation. Two concrete implementations of our widget impl trait. The same thing we would like to do with the widget itself. Let's change it into a trait. Of course we need to remove this for now. But what we want to do is add our foo function. And as before, Let's add concrete widget structs. And here they are. We have our basic widget, which implements our widget trait. Basic widget contains an implementation as a pointer. I'm using a din widget imp here, but this is not really needed. We can substitute it for basic widget imp anyway, but I just wanted to keep it similar to what that was before. But in actual code, you will most likely have something like this. The same goes for advanced widget. It simply creates a concrete implementation and forwards all calls inside. Now this code is quite different than the C++ one. And actually, the Rust code is not that useful in this form. Why? Because C++ version had private implementation up in its base widget. While in the Rust version, we only have a trait widget, which acts as a pure interface. So in reality, this isn't that useful in this form. We can argue which is better, the C++ version or the Rust version, but I just wanted to show you that both are possible. As you can see, in both cases, you can have multiple concrete widget implementations with multiple concrete widgets. All of this plays quite nice with the abstract factory pattern which we talked about earlier. Having said all of this, let's answer the question why this pattern is useful at all. The answer to this will be based on the C++ code. Simply because Rust deals with interfaces or traits quite differently than C++ and this pattern might not be that useful here. Okay, we're back to C++ for the time being. The main advantage of this pattern is interface stability. Let's take a look at our widget. You can change the implementations however you want, including adding or removing members, which would traditionally break binary compatibility. But the user code will remain unaffected 
it's irrelevant what's in the widget imp here. Whatever there is, whatever changes there will be, widget will remain the same. And since this is the only public facing part, the public interface will still be the same, regardless of what happens underneath. Users will still be able to use the interfaces, including linking with newer versions. All of this ensures very good future compatibility, enabling for example, frequent patch releases without any fear of breaking existing code. Well, at least on the interface level. So to conclude, if you want to have stable interfaces, I mean extremely stable interfaces, even to the point of binary compatibility, use the bridge pattern to hide any internal implementation details. So I hope you will find this pattern useful. I hope you will find this video useful. Hope you found all of this informative. If you have any questions, post them down below and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.